Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Riceville Valley Community Church on uh, what seems to be a really beautiful day. It's good to see you all beautiful faces, too. Uh, this morning, I have a few announcements. First of all, we have our monthly session meeting in Fellowship Hall afterwards. And also, after service, you're invited to snacks. Uh, join us for snacks and fellowship in the Fellowship Hall right through these doors. Uh, second, we have communion next week. And what that means also, uh, we have a communion meal for this quarter. And Susie, would you mind telling us a little bit about what communion meal is going to be like? Thanks, Susie. And finally, I just wanted to highlight again that we're in the process of uh, electing a new elder for, to be on session. And wanted to say, just highlight some of the characteristics uh, found in an elder based off of the Book of Order and Scripture. And that the elder is supposed to be, first of all, it's the first duty of the ruling elder to represent the mind of Christ. And that they would be a mature believer led by the Spirit and that they would be a student and teacher of God's word, worship and prayer leader, an under shepherd, present and caring to all members in pastoral need, especially the children. And then finally, an apt description for even for today's sermon is that they would be a father or mother in faith to all the members. And I wanted to let you know that we also, uh, we don't intend to just throw you into the deep end of what effectively is bivocational ministry. I understand the, uh, the, sober, uh, the sobering and uh, heavy responsibilities it is to be an under shepherd of God's people. What that means is that we also have training. We have a training guide from the denomination where we go through not just the theology and uh, how the church works, the polity, but we also go through together how to be an under shepherd for the church, uh, how to exercise the office and to visit folks and to pray with folks and to just be a servant for Christ for the sake of Christ's people. So we're not just throwing you in the deep end and it'll be a good time for me to, for that time of training together to just spend time with the candidate elect elder. And not only that, I want to open it up to any elders who are not sitting on session at that time to join us for training. I'll have the details out for uh, what the schedule will look like. Right now, we're waiting for the nominating process to kick off and go underway. But I want to give you a heads up that there will be some time, some equipping together. Yep. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it. Well, let's prepare our hearts for worship. To help prepare our hearts for worship, to kind of center us and focus us from the world and our busy lives and schedules, 
Let's attend to God's word. Psalm 105 says, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, Lord, we have many reasons to give thanks to you, and we want to do it together today, to call upon your name, to give thanks to you, to to give glory to your name. May your name be more precious, more moving to us as a result of our time together here in worship to you. Lord, we ask for your presence by your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of adoption, to be with us here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, let's stand and be called to worship. God's the one who initiates the relationship. He's the one who speaks first. He's the one who ex- showed his love to us first by sending his son. So he's the one who calls. Oh God, oh give thanks to the Lord, Holy One. We come with thanks on our lips. Sing to God, sing praises. Tell of God's wonderful works. Seek the Lord and claim God's strength. Praise the Lord. Now let's praise the Lord with a song that we get to sing together. Be seated. We've approached God, God has called us to worship Him. And we've approached Him in adoration with a song to the immortal, invisible God. And when we approach God, we don't do that lightly, we do that with reverence because of who He is. He's a holy God, He is perfectly righteous. So when you do approach someone who is perfect in all ways, you inevitably reflect on ourselves and to see how we do fall short. And that's a grace, to see who we are in light of who God is. It's a grace because we have a chance to confess together. 
to confess our sins together. The, the call to confession comes from Psalm 84. For the Lord God is our son and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. Let's find joy in trusting that God will forgive us of our sins when we confess. So let's do that privately and silently before we do that corporately and together in one voice. Let's, pr let's pray and confess it silently. Church, let's confess together. Lord God, we thank you from the depths of our hearts for your wondrous grace and love to us in Christ. You have proven your faithfulness to us in the death and resurrection of your only Son and have promised that you would not withhold any good thing from us. Yet we confess that we are full of sin and cannot walk uprightly. Help us to repent of our sins and make us willing to make restitution. Jesus Christ, with your perfect obedience given to us, we would have no hope at all of receiving favor from our Heavenly Father. You walked uprightly on our behalf yet you were treated like a criminal, losing all honor and favor before your Father. Now you are glorified and exalted, and you have lifted us up and covered our shame with your glory, even though we remain very sinful. Jesus, thank you. Spirit of the living God, you indwell us and always have your way with us. Help us to find our peace and refuge in God's protection so that we stop trying so hard to protect ourselves. Thank you for the weakness that keeps us near the cross, marveling at your rich and overwhelming grace to broken sinners. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <coughs> he gives us grace. He gives us glory. And the assurance that we have for God forgiving us of our sins lies squarely in Jesus. And here are the assurance of pardon, specifically from Romans chapter 8, some precious verses. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, <coughs> and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say? about such wonderful things as these? If God's for us, who can ever be against us? Since he didn't spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Church, in Jesus Christ, proclaimed in the gospel, our sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Let's stand and sing in response to this good news of the forgiveness of sins in Christ.
may be seated. And the children may be excused for Children's Church. God's given us voice, and for me today, barely a voice to be able to sing to him, and also a voice to be able to pray to him. He hears us because of Jesus, and he, he sees and hears the prayers like sweet incense into his presence. So let's lift up our voices as we pray, as we intercede for those that we care about right now. Lord Jesus, we do on behalf of your ascension as our humble high priest, Lord, we pray to you our heart's desires, our prayers to God. Oh God, we have many burdens, so please lighten them for us as we yoke ourselves to you in our prayers. Lord, we ask in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do ask for favorable results from surgery. And Lord, I pray you would arrange the logistics for them, for, the, for them to hear the good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, we intercede for Cecil's friend in Texas. God, specifically for this vicious and relentless cancer. Oh God, I pray that you would have mercy on them and through this suffering, through this trial, that they would find hope in God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, would you please restore Ben's mobility? Lord, we pray for a successful uh, hip replacement. Oh God, what every part is essential, but Lord, what an essential body part it is to not have working right. Oh God, have mercy on Ben. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, we pray for the labors of the pastors 
that they would not be in vain. Oh God, we pray for the message of hope, the message of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would resound everywhere and penetrate into the hearts of those who need to hear it, for the hearts of those who need to be humbled by it, into the hearts who need to find hope. Oh God, Lord, I pray that you would sustain my voice today and that you would be preached clearly, joyfully, and with hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. It's, Lord, we do pray for confidence and assurance. Lord, in spite of all the anxiety and fears of a significant transition, God, I also pray for the, the mommies and daddies. Maybe they're going to be empty nesters. And I pray that those marriages would be strengthened in this time. Lord, I pray for, for Christians who are going off to college and that you would, that you would protect them that you would strengthen their faith during this time, and that they would also find rich nourishment from fellowship and also a fantastic education. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, we, we utterly depend, Lord, right now and declare our dependence upon your faithfulness for you to be true to your word, for the promises, <clears throat> for the promises that you have made that, that you would be with your people. Lord, thank you for Josh's life. I pray that you would draw him closer to yourself and incorporate his life into the life of the church. Lord, may he flourish. May you bring a shalom into his life so that, so that whatever evil is knocking at his door, that they, they would just be not even attractive. But Lord, that his heart's affections would grow for you and that a life lived in relationship with you would be better than any other temptation in the wilderness of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
Lord, thank you again for Sandra's recovery from a, from a terrible collision. Father, I pray that you continue to surround her with a network of folks that would help with this recovery, to facilitate further recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for giving us a voice, for being a God who is unlike other gods, who would be so near to his people that he would hear their prayers and their cries. Lord, we cry out to you today with all of these burdens and prayers and even gratitude. Oh God, Father, be pleased with our obedience to speak to you to relate to you as your body, as your church today, in your mercy and in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is your kingdom and your power and your glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's continue our worship by giving our tithes and offerings. Ushers. <laughs> stand and praise God together with the doxology. Almighty God, thank you for giving us life and breath, and with this life, the resources that you've given us so you can flourish, the gospel of your son, and the roof of our heads, and the ability to be able to work and labor for your sake. Oh God, as we give back the resources you've given us, may it contribute and facilitate the work of your gospel, so that those around us our neighbors, our coworkers, and our classmates come to know the saving faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Let me pray one more time. O 
a holy God, I pray for your spirit that you would illuminate our eyes to see our Lord and Savior. In the word that's read, in the word that's preached, Lord, thank you for the means of grace, your commitment to be with your people. Father, please, again, sustain my voice as your under-shepherd, under the great shepherd, Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. The Apostle Paul writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is, Israelites, his family, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they didn't submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses wrote about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned in Sunday school with, uh, with the women, this is a, a message about our children. Be a sensitive, um, close to your heart message, but it doesn't only apply to our children. But that's going to be the primary focus for today. The Apostle Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for my people, the Israelites, is that they may be saved. That's the Apostle Paul. Those are the words of the Messiah's messenger to the non-Jewish world, to everyone else in the world who are not his people. Is salvation on your heart these days? Or do you feel the same way about certain people in your life? Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for my mother is that she may be saved. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for my children is that they may be saved. Fathers and mothers in Christ, your children have been on my heart and prayers to God lately, right alongside with you, that your children may be saved. 
I didn't run any sophisticated, <laughs> sophisticated statistics on the church roster or anything. But I think it's fair to say that the majority of the children, the majority of the children, whether they're biological or adopted, the majority of the children of the fathers and mothers here at Riceville do not regularly worship God on the Lord's Day. Consider with me here. How many children do you have? What's on their agenda for today? Now, what I'm not saying is that church attendance equals being saved. Church attendance does not equal being saved. But if you believe what the book of Hebrews says about not neglecting to meet with one another, if you believe in the means of grace, in the reading and hearing, preaching and listening of God's word, the singing of God's word, the praying of God's word, all confirmed and ratified in baptism and the Lord's Supper. If you believe that what we are doing right now between the hours of 11 and 12 something p.m. has any eternal significance, then worship attendance or the lack of it should surface up prayers to God for them and some difficult conversations with your children, which I bet you've already had. When we, when we use the language of, is someone saved or not? It raises a lot of questions, right? It sounds so definitive. <coughs> and as a result, when you're talking about, is someone saved or not? it easily raises doubts. When it comes to your children, you can calm your doubts. You can calm your doubts with, I know, I know their way of life doesn't show it right now, but I know deep down they love the Lord. I hear you. I know what you mean when you lean on that. I say this with a heart as a father of three children. To say, to say the opposite, to say anything else like, I don't know if they love the Lord, or I know they don't love the Lord. For me to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart anything else other than I know they love the Lord as a Christian father myself would break my heart. The Apostle Paul's heart's desire was like that for his people, the Israelites, to be saved. But he says the problem wasn't that they didn't love the Lord. The problem is that he knows, he testifies that they have zeal for God, as it says in verse 2. You could imagine the Apostle Paul also saying this about the family of Israel. I know they love the Lord. The problem wasn't the lack of love and zeal for God. What broke the Apostle Paul's heart was that their zeal wasn't according to knowledge in the ESV translation. Right? And it's not just 
general knowledge about God or knowing bits and pieces of scripture here and there. It was knowing and submitting to Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified as the Lord. That was such a stumbling block for the Jews. Instead, they ignored him, as it says in verse 3. It's not just God in general they didn't submit to. They didn't submit to Jesus specifically. By not submitting to God's anointed one, which is what the word Christ means, they ignored God and God's righteousness. The righteousness of God, again, another one of those words you can probably dash in your Bible if you mark it up. The righteousness of God is God doing what is right that's based on his perfect character. He is faithful to his promises. He is true to his word. God's righteousness is God doing what's right to put in place a way for sinful people to have a right relationship with God. Since Jesus came, that means Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to have that right relatedness to God. The gospel about Jesus reveals the righteousness, his faithfulness, and the way to have a right relationship with God. So when you reject Jesus, when you ignore Jesus, you reject God. There is no distinction between God and Jesus when it comes to who you've got to submit to. For a long time, since the exodus out of Egypt and the covenant God made with his people through Moses on Mount Sinai. The way God's people had a right relationship with God was through the law of Moses. By grace, the Israelites were saved, not by works or from themselves. It couldn't have been by works or from themselves, since the Israelites were slaves and only working for Pharaoh. It wasn't by works so that no one can boast. Moses said that exact same thing in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse four to, Deuteronomy chapter nine, verses four to six. There is no distinction between grace and God's glory. But that version, to, and to use a, an older uh, theological term in our tradition, that administration of the covenant of grace expired since the coming of Jesus. It wasn't the way to be in right relationship with God anymore. Verse 4 says, Christ is the end of of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes in him. The end of the law here means a couple things. First, the old covenant era, this this part in the history of salvation is over as the way sinful people relate to God. And second, Jesus is therefore to be the end goal, the final purpose of that old covenant that it was pointing to all along. There's, a, a new tes- uh, there's one uh, New Testament commentary that said, it's helpful to think of the end like the finish line of a race. When people reach the finish line, the race is over. The race has ended. And the finish line is also the goal to which the racers are all 
headed. <clears throat> Meaning, now, as it says in Hebrews also, now is the time for Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. There is no distinction between Jesus being what the Old Testament has always pointed to and Jesus bringing the Old Covenant to an end. So, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if Jesus is the righteousness of God revealed, that means if you ignore Jesus, the only option is to establish a righteousness of your own. Again, the problem isn't ignoring God. It's ignoring Jesus, who is God. The Apostle Paul's family did just that. It was so difficult. That was the right way to relate to God for so long, even though they kept failing. That's why the Old Testament kept adding more books, but that was what they knew on how to relate to God. The Apostle Paul families did just that. Ignore the new righteousness of God. They were zealous for God. They loved God. But the way in which they found their right standing before God was to establish their own righteousness. So if you consider your child, your children, or a family member in the prodigal category, how are you praying for them? That's, that's not meant to be a, a condemning rhetorical question, right? Ask, how, recall, take note of, how are you praying for them? How, how do you think they've established a righteousness of their own outside of Christ? The Apostle Paul's family's righteousness continue to be on what has expired. That's not the way to do it anymore. But a standard of righteousness you can make up. You know, it doesn't have to be on the Bible at all. You could use any kind of law of your own based on any standard of righteousness you come up with. It could be based on anything, right? Pick anything from one of the different cultures and values that overlap here in the valley so that you can look at yourself and say, I'm okay. And at the same time, look at other people and declare them unrighteous. At least I'm not like them. And as a result, exclude them. Just like the law-based righteousness of the, of the Israelites that excluded the Gentiles. There's no distinction between self-righteousness and pride and presumption. This is exactly what, this was exactly the opposite of what God intended. The Apostle Paul, as the Jewish missionary to a non-Jewish world, worked long and hard to understand why people responded to Jesus the way he did. You can see it in the book of Acts. He did this by going back to the Old Testament scriptures to try to understand why the Gentiles were believing and following Jesus on the one hand, while the majority of his Jewish family didn't. <coughs> he read scripture with new eyes that he got on the road to Damascus. He saw this difficult and heartbreaking pastoral, multicultural, and religious issues between Jews and Gentiles in the law of Moses and the prophets. Right? That's why you have the letters. That's why Paul had to write these letters. That's why he wrote and dedicated at least three chapters specifically in the book of Romans to this issue. That's why we have this letter to the Galatian church. He saw 
in the Bible, his Bible at the time, the Hebrew scriptures, he saw there was no more biblical basis to exclude anymore. Why? Because of Jesus. You can read Romans chapter 4 for more details on that. Now, the rest of our passage. The rest of our passage shows how the apostle came to the conclusion of no more exclusion. He read the law of Moses and the prophets in view of God's mercy in Jesus. The point is that the gospel that requires your faith in response isn't far from you. He read this in Deuteronomy. Moses wrote about this. The word isn't far from you, nor is it far from your children, especially if they've been baptized and if they've been raised in this church. And I saw those pictures when someone graciously surfaced up some old church directories, and I love them. I love looking at old church directories because it tells me, as the new guy, your new pastor, that you were there, and you were there, and you were there, and you were there, and so were your children. To listen to God's word preached, to sing God's praises, to be a part of this body in fellowship in Christ, you were there. That tempers my own, any kind of illusions of grandeur to be an agent of change to sanctify Riceville Valley Community Church as if the spirit were not here 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago. It tempers my pride and presumption to know that you were here. You don't have to go to heaven to bring Christ down. Think Advent and Christmas. You also don't need to go down to the grave to find Jesus. Think Good Friday and Easter. And there's also the spirit of Jesus. Think Ascension Sunday and Pentecost. That is how the word is near. And then the Apostle Paul continues in our passage to cite two more prophets, Isaiah and Joel. By doing so, we learn that, wait, God does make a distinction. The distinction, when when the prophets are looking forward to the day of the Messiah, when they're looking forward to the Spirit poured out anew, when they're looking forward for the law of God to be in the hearts of people, where the word would be close. God makes a distinction, not ethnically, Jew or Gentile, but the distinction that God makes from the beginning to the end of the Bible, whether old or new, what never seems to expire is the distinction between the proud and the humble. Pride isn't ethnically exclusive. Pride is inclusive of everyone. It's in you. It's in me. It's in your children. That's what the prophet Isaiah wrote about. That's what Romans chapters 1 through 3 is all about. As I said in Sunday school, even the garden had a serpent. Humility on the other hand, is exclusive. Humility is what is needed to believe in Jesus. Everyone needs to take step zero. But he's only for everyone who humbly believes. It's for everyone to believe, to believe that the righteousness of your own is not the way to God. It only condemns you. It only puts you in a vicious cycle of guilt and shame. Instead, listen to verse 11 of our passage again. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. If that describes you today, 
if that describes you today, if God's distinction that never expires describes you today, then repent. Repent not just from sin, but turn your back on self-righteousness, on your righteousness, the DIY self-established righteousness of your own. Instead, turn towards God and call on the name of Jesus, no matter where you are in life, no matter how old or how young, no matter which school district you, you grew up in, no matter which political affiliation, no matter how many regrets you have, call on him. Call on Jesus. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. That's what the prophet Joel was all about. I, I read this article a while ago that reported on why folks just don't come to church anymore. And like most articles and research and polls, the biggest factor still seems to be COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. It was... the lockdowns and its effects. Now this article highlighted the new habit that folks formed during lockdown. Right. In-person gatherings became non-essential. Uh, telework, remote work was approved. There was some, lar there was some like, large percentage of folks around my age, I think uh, the Gen Xers and Millennials, especially with young children, who settled into a routine where they considered regular attendance to worship on Sundays was about once a month. Apparently, there is a distinction between regular and frequent. Now, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go into sociological or such and psychological deep dive into church attendance in these crazy times. That's not the point. <laughs> I'm not even qualified to do any of those. The point is that old ministry models and programs have expired. If you build it, they will come. It doesn't seem to work anymore. That means for us, Riceville, to be the beautiful feet, to bring the hope of the gospel to your children and anyone else who ignores Jesus is to go where they are. The point is this, to be like Jesus. I don't know if your children love the Lord. With my kids at their age, it's hard to tell, too. I don't know if they're saved or not. But, I, but what I do know is this. I know what John 3.16 says. If your children were baptized in the name of the Trinity, then that baptism still preaches to them. Remind them help them recall that as real as they were wet from the water sprinkled, poured, or they were immersed in, as real as they were wet from, wa from the water is as real as God's righteousness to put them in a right relationship with himself through Jesus. Church, when someone is baptized here, when we fill that fountain with a little bit of water, maybe warmed up a little bit, when someone is baptized, that means someone made vows somewhere at some point in time. Commit to those vows. I know that God has raised people into the love 
of the Trinity in heaven. And we're supposed to extend that love of the Trinity to others here on earth. I know verses 14 to 15 in our passage says that God has ordained a way to get the gospel out to people here on earth so they can hear and believe. I know that if they have the spirit of adoption, they will call on the name of the Lord Jesus and cry out, Abba, Father, and be saved. That's what I know. Now, may the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me pray. O oh, Father in heaven, we know your heart's desire that all should be saved. Lord, we know you, you loved us first, that we know what love is because you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross, to be a propitiation for sins, to free us from the shackles of sin, the bondage of Pharaoh-like evil in our lives. I pray for liberation. I pray for humility. I pray for step zero to be taken among our children. I pray for family members who don't know Jesus in the right relatedness that they need with their maker. Father, have mercy and send your spirit to prepare the way for the beautiful feet that you've called us to be. Lord Jesus, we pray, we honor you, and we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing to our faithful, righteous Savior, Jesus.
May this good word be my last breath for you. As you go out and serve the Lord with your beautiful feet, may your words that you share with others be a timely one, seasoned with salt, and go with the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.